Uh, Dr. Barlett, can you do the honors? I can do the honors. <clears throat> do you want to talk about the the seminars in general, or should we move straight into the uh, today's seminar? Uh, yeah, so we're going to be having seminars. Uh, from This is the first seminar, and uh, they start at 1 o'clock every Tuesday. And we're, first we are going to have a student, and then the main speaker normally by a PI, uh, but today we have uh, only Dr. Fried. And thank you everyone for at, uh, attending the seminar. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Mwali. So welcome <clears throat> to all of the new students who've uh, joined us uh, for this semester, and we wish you much luck in your studies. So the, the seminars are an important um, aspect of your sort of general knowledge in, in surgery. And we're extremely lucky today to have um, Professor uh, Fried uh, join us. He is a professor in the Department of Surgery and he's Associate Dean for Education, Technology and Innovation, as well as Director for the Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. And he recently served as Clinical Director of the Clinical Innovation Platform. <clears throat> Previously, Dr. Freed was the Edward Archibald Professor and Chairman of the Department of Surgery from uh, 2010 to 2020. <clears throat> and uh, amongst some of the uh, mistakes he made in that position was uh, was hiring me. So, uh, so I'm here because of him. So uh, you can blame him. So as Department Chair, he led a renewal of the uh, graduate program. And now, as you know, we have... Um, concentrations in global surgery, education, outcomes, innovation, and digital health, thanks to his work. So in 2021, um, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada awarded him the Duncan Graham Award for Outstanding Contribution to Medical, medical Education. And in 2019, he received the Meritus Service Cross from the Governor General of Canada in recognition of his leadership in the development of minimally invasive surgery. He served as the president of the Canadian Association of General Surgeons and the president of the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, the Central Surgical Association, the Canadian Association of Chairs of Surgical Research, the James IV Association of Surgeons Canada, and uh, he was chair of the board, board of Regents of the American College of Surgeons and has given over 300, now 301 uh, lectures internationally and nationally and uh, publishes widely on uh, minimally invasive surgery, innovation and surgical education. Dr. Fried, welcome. We're looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you, Jake. And uh, Baxton, it's a pleasure. And um, I look forward to having the chance over the semester to meet all of the students in person at some point. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about today really is a um, combination of several of the things that Dr. Barrelet mentioned in terms of my uh, my background. One is uh, surgical education, which occupies much of my time currently, and uh, image-guided surgery, which is really the uh, technological uh, transformation that uh, uh, I had a chance to witness and it really, really boosted a lot uh, of, uh, of my career. And uh, just mention uh, as a disclosure that I currently serve as a consultant to a company called Theater, which is an artificial intelligence computer vision company that extracts uh, data from surgical video recordings that can be used for education and quality initiatives. And I, I really, I'm not going to speak about this very much, although it is an area that I'm particularly excited about and would be happy to talk to people about at some point. Now, all of you are, you know, enrolled in the uh, graduate program doing some form of surgical research. And I guess the question is, why do we have surgical research? Why do we as surgeons or scientists uh, want to conduct research in surgical problems? Well, traditionally, it's to, uh, to form a clear understanding of the diseases we treat 
so that we could uh, either prevent them or uh, improve the outcomes. Um, we have dedicated ourselves to developing new technologies as well as educational programs. And often the goal of these is to improve quality of what we do, but also to decrease the variability in surgical care. Um, you, you know, many of you are part of the IRR, in, in, injury uh, recovery and um, something, a repair. And, um, and, and therefore, you, you, I think you could appreciate that a lot of the surgical techniques that have evolved over the last 30 years or, or so have been designed specifically to decrease the injury of surgery. And surgery, when we operate on people, actually, it, we, we induce an injury. I'll talk about that. Um, you might also conduct research in optimizing patient outcomes through uh, various um, interdisciplinary or multimodal approaches to patient care that may start in the preoperative uh, phase as a prehabilitation and through the surgical and recovery phase as an ERAS or enhanced recovery after surgery program. Uh, or you might um, be involved in creating or implementing systems, policies, and procedures to decrease disparity, improve access to optimal surgical care. And that might be something that uh, someone in the global surgery program uh, would be interested in. Uh, I'm gonna focus mostly today on the aspect of surgical research that I've been most involved in in my career, and that is developing the technology as well as the educational programs specifically designed to improve quality and decrease variability of surgical care. Now, I'd just like to start by advancing the premise that surgery is a performance field. It is a complex one. Um, the stakes are high and it's traditionally been taught through an apprenticeship model. Over the, the last 30 years or so, the advent of simulation has really changed the way we train surgeons. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And it has got us to start to look at how we measure or assess surgical performance. In many fields, it's, it's relatively easy to do. You do a run a 100 meter race and you, you have a time, you play golf and you have a score. Uh, many performance fields uh, have an assessment that is inherently built in and it's a metric or the measure of whether we're actually uh, improving. I'd like to talk a bit about the application of uh, methods used for training other um, elite performance fields to mastery. And then I'll end a little bit about touching on how technology, artificial intelligence have a role in the future of surgical education. So let's start right at the beginning. For those of you who are not surgeons, you might ask yourself, what is surgery and how does it differentiate itself from other aspects of healthcare? Well, surgery might involve making an incision. So in the earliest forms of surgery, a person would have an infection, maybe a boil or something like that. And we would open that infection, drain the pus, and, and improve them. Uh, there are other areas where just making an incision itself can cure a problem, like carpal tunnel might be an example. And then we moved on to actually removing diseased organs. So a person comes in with appendicitis or a gallbladder that's infected full of stones or a cancer, then our, our surgical mission would be to remove that. Um, as surgery became more sophisticated, we actually were able to develop technologies to repair or reconstruct uh, tissues. So an example might be that a person has got a hernia and using the available tissues, we, we can repair the defect. Or if a person has heartburn due to acid from the stomach coming up into the esophagus, we could construct uh, a valve using your own tissues. Uh, or even things like plastic surgery, where we might um, remodel uh, the nose for uh, cosmetic purposes or to help someone breathe better. And then uh, in, in the last hundred years or so, one of the big advances has been the ability to take a body part out and to replace it with another body part, such as a hip replacement or an organ transplant. So essentially, everything that we do in surgery can be categorized in, in one of these domains. Now, as I said earlier, the problem with surgical care is that we most of the time have to actually can create an injury in order to achieve the goals of surgery. And that is that injury is the cost of surgery. The benefits should be obvi obvious. People come for surgery because they seek 
a solution to their medical problem. Uh, generally, they, they look for something that is long lasting or permanent. Um, they look to avoid long-term medications. And the thing about surgery that is it um, attractive both to surgeons and often to patients is that the outcome of surgery, the results of surgery are obvious in most cases. And, and the, the results uh, for people that like immediate gratification, like many surgeons, the results are usually obvious over the short term. Now, on the other hand, as I said, surgery causes injury and there's a downside to what we do. And that generally is the incision. And the incision itself, never mind what we do inside, can cause pain, scarring, deformity, a cosmetic uh, problems. And generally there, there is a recovery period just to heal the injury that we uh, create at the time of surgery. And during recovery, patients often have a loss of function and a loss of mobility. So why do we have to make such an incision? Well, usually it's for access. And we have to make an incision that is large enough for us to actually see inside the body and to allow light to go inside. And in many, in many times to put our hands in to actually feel what we're doing. Now, the more surface the um, target, the, um, the less we have to make uh, an incision in order to get access. And really we're limited only by the size of the disease that we're trying to remove. But the deeper it is in, inside, generally the harder it is to see there are other uh, uh, organs in the way and we have to push them out of the way in order to expose what we're trying to see. So let's get back to, to surgery. As I said earlier, I like to think of surgery as a performance field. And each of us who practices surgery should aspire to be an elite performer or a master in our field. Now, the difference between what we do and what maybe a musician does or a grandmaster chess player or an elite athlete does is the stakes of what we do are high and to the, the errors that we make have implications not, not to us, but to our patients. And so we, you know, we are challenged to come up with a way to get to mastery without uh, practicing on our patient. One of the other challenges is that there is infinite variability in our patients and their diseases. So we cannot model a performance perfectly so that we could rehearse it over and over again, like you might with a piece of music or practicing a shot in, in sports or practicing putting over and over again. Really only over the last, I would say 30 to 40 years, have, have people really been constrained by the ethical environment in which we work? And it's quite clear now that practice on patients has become unethical. As I said earlier, it's unpredictable. It could be very expensive and it's an inefficient way to train people. We can no longer let um, learners make errors and learn from their mistakes in a clinical environment. The other thing that, that is a concern is that when we try to develop a curriculum, in most other educational fields, we plan out or map out a curriculum. But in clinical practice, we have less control of who comes through the door. And so to determine a curriculum based on opportunity like we've done in the past is not ideal. So we need to do better. And we also have a responsibility not only to train people, but at the end of training to certify for the public that the individuals that we allow to practice meet the standards that they expect of them, because as a profession, we have the privilege of certifying our own trainees. And then we have to make sure that each individual surgeon maintains their level of performance at the highest level through a career that might span 40 years after training. So let's go back to elite performers and ask ourselves, what can we learn from one another? And I think this, uh, you know, Bob Dylan, who uh, is a Nobel Prize laureate in literature, uh, he uh, he said a lot of very meaningful things in his songs. But I think the the most the, the song that probably resonates the most with me is the song that the times they are a changing, and nothing stands still. And no matter how good you are at any moment in time, someone will surpass you, and you will deteriorate in terms of your 
uh, your performance. But another thing that struck me when Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize is wondering how we got there. And you just don't go from being illiterate to writing poetry that, that people are willing to pay for. Getting to mastery in, uh, in poetry, for example, involves knowing an alphabet, developing a vocabulary, understanding how to put words together uh, to meet certain conventions so that people can understand them, then developing a way to uh, put this all together in meaningful prose. And ultimately, I would say poetry is probably the highest level of uh, written communication. So you, if you want to get to be a, a Nobel Prize winning poet, you have to start with the basis, you build a foundation. And once that foundation is, is internalized, then you can be creative and write um, poetry. And the training of the surgeon follows a, a somewhat similar model. There is a body of knowledge that every surgeon is responsible to know. There are technical skills that they must develop. Then they have to put this together using sound judgment and decision-making so that they could actually adapt to situations on the fly. And only when they put all of these together do they develop competence. Now, the challenge is becoming greater and greater since medical knowledge is not developing at a linear rate, but it's expanding exponentially. And it's estimated that the doubling time of uh, medical knowledge um, currently is in the range of two months. And if you think about that, it's 40 years since I graduated from medical school. Um, it's more than 40 years, almost 50 years. Um, and it is striking um, you know, how you expect somebody out in practice, busy every day to maintain um, a expertise in the information, just the information that is changing at such a rapid pace. However, to measure knowledge, we do have methods that are uh, tried and proven. Uh, we could use multi multiple choice questions. We could look at the application of knowledge in a clinical context uh, through oral examination, or we could develop objective st uh, structured clinical encounters or simulations to test the pe person's utilization of knowledge in a planned objective way and assess them. And that's not much different between surgical and non-surgical specialties. But surgical skills are what really uh, differentiate us. And just like knowledge, new skills and innovative procedures are rapidly being developed. And at the same time, the amount of hours available uh, by law to train people uh, has, has reduced significantly uh, over the past 30 years. We're in a very um, value-driven society now. And the cost of operating room time is a premium. So to waste time to teach people skills in the operating room that they could learn outside the operating room is not acceptable. As I said earlier, it's no longer appropriate to uh, practice on patients. And the public has focused on medical errors. So uh, we are responsible to disclose errors when we make them. And this can uh, cause a great deal of um, pushback, particularly if medical errors occur in training people um, where we can train them in a, in a better way. So technical skills in surgery can be general. So just, you know, the coordination we talk about, the use of both hands, the eye-hand coordination, et cetera, all those type of skills that, that people require, not just in, in surgery, but in sports or music, et cetera. And then we have to develop the use of those skills in specialized environments, be they open surgery, image-guided surgery, et cetera. And then they have to apply them to the clinical field of their training. And, and within those clinical fields, they have to develop procedure-specific skills. Finally, they have to develop them and use them in a team environment because you cannot do most operations in isolation. You have to use an assistant efficiently and effectively. You have to communicate and interact with the nurses and anesthesiologists, et cetera. So technical skills in surgery are complex. And finally, while you're doing all that, you constantly have to adapt to new information and to what you find in the course of an operation or a complication that occurs in the operating room. You have to be able to think on your feet and deal with the unexpected. I show this video because these are two uh, elite athletes. On, on the left of the slide is Roger Federer. On the right is uh, uh, Rafael Nadal. And you're going to see them both hit a, a forehand shot in tennis. 
completely different style. And you might say, how do you teach uh, people to emulate the skill level of these two people when they do it so differently? And some of their, their differences are stylistic and some of their similarities that are embedded in the way they play um, are, are, are the same. And those um, technical aspects that both of them do the same are the type of things we need to focus on. You cannot hit the ball if your eye's not on the ball, for instance. There is a certain uh, angle of the racket and the ball at the point of impact that will create a, a successful shot and will determine whether it's going to be uh, a shot that has a curvature or topspin to it, et cetera. So when we look at performance, uh, we have to analyze those things that are fundamental to uh, to good performance and recognize that people's body bodies may be different, their, their skill levels may be different, and they may have stylistic differences. Now, I would say that over my career, the thing that changed surgery the most was the introduction of image-guided surgery. And the image-guided surgery, you might think of it in terms of the what, what we call a laparoscopy or arthroscopy or robotics or flexible end endoscopy. And we, we've shown, uh, we being the profession, not me uh, personally, but that image-guided surgery it can be safe and effective if done by skilled surgeons. However, we've also witnessed the catastrophe of poorly trained surgeons eager to adopt these new procedures resulting in harm uh, to our patients. And, and therefore it became an, uh, the responsibility of specialty societies and leadership in surgery to set guidelines for programs to train and verify the surgeons had the skills that the public deserves. So on the good side, uh, minimally invasive surgery was identified by Forbes magazine as one of the 10 most important innovations in 30 years in all fields. And that is um, up there with the, um, uh, with the iPhone and uh, internet, et cetera. I mean, it really truly rev revolutionized healthcare. And this is what it did. It took, this is a gallbladder scar uh, before laparoscopy. Uh, you could see it's about a six inch scar under the ribs on the right hand upper abdomen. And uh, not only did it look ugly, but it took about six weeks for someone having this operation to be able to go back to full activities. And on the other side, you see an example of um, a mini laparoscopy for the exactly same operation. And yes, this individual has four scars. There's one here. There's one here, there's one in the belly button that you can't see, and there's one somewhere up here, it's very hard to see. Uh, but that person uh, was out of the hospital in two hours and back to work in three days. So it shows you um, kind of dramatically, I think, how we've evolved surgical care. Now, the problem was in the early 90s when laparoscopic surgery was uh, being introduced and surgeons were in a rush to to adopt it because they were worried that their practice would be lost to those who had developed these skills, patients were dying from complications. And it was pretty ugly. It was in the newspaper. And e even uh, in Australia, they the government put a stop to the use of laparoscopy for hernia repair after a major um, athlete, I believe it was an Aussie rules football player, um, had a uh, life-threatening complication of a hernia operation. We were not uh, taking ownership. And then the government was putting into place stringent restrictions on, uh, on, on this type of surgery. Now, it's clear that what we do in the operating room matters. So we can't always evaluate technology just be based on the technology. It's really the way the technology is introduced, how we ensure that people are using it, are properly trained and properly certified. So we must aspire to excellence and train to excellence and maintain that throughout the careers. So the problem with introduction of minimally invasive surgery, which is an example to us, was the educational program was, was poor and it was provided by industry and their motivation was just getting people to buy their products. There was very little um, education into the physiology of, of this new surgery and hazards and risks and pitfalls available when adopting it. And there were no tests to make sure someone who took a two-day course actually had acquired the knowledge and skills to be able to, to practice this. And if you think about this, if 
we didn't uh, step in and correct this, then all the benefit of this operation, which has, as I said earlier, has been one of the most impactful uh, health technologies um, in my in, in my lifetime, uh, would not have been introduced. So it taught us that we had to rethink the training pro, um, process. So it gets back to how do you develop technical proficiency? You get back to Bob Dylan here. And there is a learning curve. There is a, a relationship between practice and performance that any performance field uh, does, recognizing that different people learn at different rates. And there are lots of reasons for the variability among people. So just saying that a person trained for, for four hours or two weeks is not sufficient. Um, it, it really is, uh, it, it is a demonstration of proficiency that's important. And this is a, a classic learning curve that uh, might be applied to any performance field. The red line is the curve. And it, you could think of if you're starting from scratch, your performance at the beginning would be would be somewhere down here. There's a rapid phase of early learning. And then there's this plateau phase where you kind of uh, reach an asymptote where this might be um, performance that you achieve with unlimited practice. And the goal that we had was to switch learning in the operating room, which had been traditionally the model of training, to learning in the, um, in the lab, and then coming into the operating room when you had uh, already ascended a good part of the learning curve. And that led us to under understand the, the importance of metrics, because as I said earlier, metrics provide a reference point, and it allows you to, to follow the progress of someone um, and use the uh, performance measures as a cutoff point to determine when you could certify and credential someone. And the, the metrics um, are not only a reference point, but they have to be meaningful to the learner. So you have to learn something from the feedback you get from these measures so that you could purposefully try to improve yourself. And they must be reliable. That means if I measure your performance or someone else measures it, our scores should be the same. And validity means that what we measure in the test must reflect the value that we're really trying to measure, and that is performance in the operating room. It should be predictive of that. Now, if you ask yourself how you would rate a surgeon, this is uh, these are some of the things that are currently available. This is a, a visual analog scale, like is used for a pain scale, where zero would be the worst possible performance, and 10 might be the ideal surgical performance. You could show videos to uh, thousands of people on the internet and ask crowd use crowdsourcing, and this has been used to rate performance in surgical videos. You could generate uh, rating scales with anchors on them to, um, to determine what is a one, a five, a 10, et cetera, and rank people according to specific criteria. You could uh, have a checklist when you check off when a person does something or, and uh, don't give them a point if they don't do it. You could look at the end product evaluation. So if you're asking yourself to, uh, yourself to um, uh, get a surgeon to sew two things together. You can uh, evaluate the, the product and see, uh, are the two things uh, properly aligned? Is there a leak? Uh, is there a narrowing at the point of, of the uh, joining, et cetera? You could measure how efficient they are, and you could determine whether or not they have errors. And all of these should be part of uh, consideration when you measure surgical performance. Now, in the clinical environment, it, it's much more difficult. Uh, we can watch a uh, uh, an operation um, live. Uh, we could watch it on video. We could watch a whole procedure, only parts of the procedure. But it's difficult to evaluate people in the clinical environment because every case is different. We may have a bias. Well, we may not like the person. We may want to teach them a lesson. Um, we have to reflect the differences in the disease and the patient. Um, any operation involves a team. So if the anesthesia is really not good, the nurse is not very good, or the assistants aren't very good, it's hard to figure out the contribution of the surgical person you're trying to evaluate. You can't let errors be made in the clinical environment because protecting patient safety is important. And we have to remember that uh, the operating room uh, is a valuable resource and we can't waste it. So the, the operating room is not the ideal uh, environment. We also have to understand that there's a difference between what we call formative assessment and summative assessment. Formative assessment is assessment you do as feedback, and it provides valuable information that the learner could use to improve themselves. 
Summative uh, assessment is an assessment that will have consequences tied to it. Pass or fail, um, credential a person or don't credential a person, et cetera. So we have to understand the, the whole field of metrics if we're going to apply it in elite performance development. Now, because we don't have a gold standard in the operating room, the real practice, our goal when we're developing a program to train people in minimally invasive surgery is to develop new methods and, and set standards to ensure that these me uh, metrics were appropriate. And we did this in a simulated environment because it was totally controlled. They're available at any time you want. You could standardize them. You could let people make errors. You could reproduce it from person to person. It is learner-centered, and it lets itself ideally to reliable assessment. And this allows us to control the curriculum, to teach properly, to measure performance, set goals, set standards for, for promotion or, or passing. We could individualize the pace of learning for each person. We could allow uh, specific and objective feedback, which could then generate new learning goals. And we could use the feedback on observed observe performance in the operating room to remediate and to set out a training program. So recognizing that image-guided surgery is different from open surgery, when we were developing our educational program, we had to understand how it differs and what specifically we wanted to teach that was unique to MIS. And that is monocular vision. So you're only looking through one eye, magnification, uh, that our hands did not have the same degrees of freedom as we had in open surgery, that we we're operating through a fixed point in the abdominal wall, which led to a fulcrum effect or a lever effect, and that we were using long instruments like chopsticks that amplify tremor and provide um, tactile feedback. So this is the challenge. This is an operation that we um, call a Heller myotomy for achalasia. It is for a person who's unable to swallow. The valve between their swallowing tube or esophagus and their stomach is always in the closed position. Um, we have to go in and divide the muscle layers of the esophagus without making a hole in the lining layer, which we call the mucosa. If we make a hole in the mucosa, all the undigested food leaks out into the chest or abdomen, and the, the consequences of this can be quite catastrophic. So you have to have unique um, sense of depth and precision, be able to do this um, efficiently and precisely, don't get into bleeding, don't go too deep, don't go too shallow, and ultimately to, to do this uh, perfectly. And this is a life-changing operation if done properly. If it's done imperfect, imperfectly, it could be a catastrophic uh, lethal intervention. So how do we teach people? So we get back to the foundations. You have to learn good habits from the start, do deliberate practice, evaluate people for formative feedback, and then generate more practice and specific practice, individualized for the person, reevaluate and do this in a simulated protective environment where a person could come and practice just like they would if they wanted to practice the piano or a sport. And in order to do this, we developed a simple um, simulator. This is Dr. Melina Vasilio when she was doing uh, her master's and uh, we developed a simulation using inexpensive um, parts and components that we put into a trainer box with uh, an opaque cover. People had to use the video and ca carry out a series of tasks that we developed metrics for. That And these metrics rewarded efficiency and precision. It penalized errors. They were objective, reliable, and valid. And we did a, a series of validation exercises. This is an example of one where we took people with um, self uh, who self-rated themselves as junior intermediate or senior in terms of their expertise. We brought people in from five countries, 215 people, and we were able to show that our simulation metrics separated them out. And the 95% confidence intervals at each level did not um, cross. So that they're really um, highly um, uh, useful in, uh, in evaluating performance. Using the trainer box, we showed that we could train people up to a proficiency level and that that level could be maintained over uh, a long period of time, so six and 12 months, uh, with just uh, periodic um, reinforcements in the simulated environment. Um, so we developed this simulation, and I, there's a lot more data, but I'm not going um, to bore you with it. 
Um, but ultimately, our goal once we developed the simulation showed that we could measure performance and train people in it was to show that what we measured in the simulator actually reflected performance in the operating room. But we didn't have a way to measure performance in the operating room. So again, we tasked Melina with developing a scoring system for performance specific to the laparoscopic skills uh, that we wanted to evaluate. And she developed a global rating scale, which we called GOALS, the Global Operative Assessment of Laparoscopic Skills. Um, we, uh, we tested our trainees on a part of the operation where they couldn't do much harm. We had two um, live uh, evaluators in the operating room who were blinded to who these people were, evaluated them and scored them from one to 25. This is what the rating scale looked like. And we were able to uh, develop a high level of reliability between people doing the measurements and showed in each of those areas that we could differentiate uh, more novice people from experienced people. And ultimately show that our scores that we measured in the simulator were highly correlated with um, double blinded scores measured in the operating room. And so from scratch, we developed a simulation that could train people, assess performance and demonstrate that we could develop metrics that were reliable and valid. And then the next step was to look at whether training in the system um, was uh, transferable to the operating room. And if so, how much training it took to make a measurable improvement in the operating room. And this was a, a randomized um, controlled study um, where control residents trained in the operating room as they always had and the um, the trained residents trained to a level that was pre-established. We called a proficiency level in the simulator box. On the top is their performance in the simulator. Um, the the pass just uh, to, to let you know would be around eighty. The pass score. Um, so although there was some improvement uh, in the control people, uh, they would not have passed the FLS test. None of them, and the all the trainees passed pass the test because that was a criterion for establishing proficiency and scored uh, scored well. The improvement over a period of about six months in the control people was pretty minimal. Um, a level of a 15 would be the level that we would expect uh, for um, 12 to 15 for um, novice uh, people in the operating room. The, the people that train in the simulator uh, got from a, a went from a score of 11 to a score of 17. Now, what does that mean? That means that the score of uh, 17 is equivalent to the um, score of a third year resident. So they went from the average score of a first year resident to the average score of a third year resident. And it took them uh, essentially six hours uh, on the average, two hours proctored, four hours um, independent practice in order to get that level of improvement. So it was kind of proof of principle that training in a simulator can improve performance in the real world. And it was a very efficient way to achieve that. So in order to, uh, to meet a need uh, of um, uh, establishing a standardized training program for minimally invasive surgery, uh, we developed this simulator. Uh, we, show, we developed metrics and uh, we were able to show that it seems to work. So once people had acquired their fundamental skills, our next challenge was to uh, um, get them to build on these skills, so going from basically your vocabulary to writing your prose or writing your poetry, to be able to start to do specific procedures. And we use the same model. Uh, here are two of our fellows, uh, one from Japan, one from Kuwait. They were tasked to build a simulator to teach laparoscopic hernia surgery and uh, to do it for less than $50. And they went out to hardware stores and material supply stores. They built an anatomically accurate uh, reproduction of the uh, groin anatomy and uh, built an operation that we could do in the same trainer box as we were using for our FLS program. They developed metrics. Um, and again, we're able to show that performance in the simulator perform, uh, predicted performance in the operating room. And they were able to build increasing complex uh, operations with the same model to, to be able to actually uh, to test and train in um, uh, operations for recurrent hernias after prior failed surgery. So uh, really a nice model and um, uh, a very valuable addition to the curricula. So 
how do you implement it? How do you develop uh, clinical um, elite performance? You need dedicated time for teaching and practice. And it's the same thing as any elite performance. You need to define your goals and your curriculum. You need to have a measure of progress. You need to set goals. And then you once you've got the foundational set, you have to build increasingly challenging simulations that reflect performances. And then while you do that, you have to motivate the learner by providing them an opportunity to use these skills during real operations in the real environment. This is just a view of our Sim Center. Many of you have probably seen it. Those that haven't are welcome to come anytime and be happy to show you the way we train. And then we took this, this product that we had developed to train people in their skills to SAGEDS, which is uh, the largest general surgical specialty society in North America. And we combined it with a knowledge uh, program that they had developed. And we have now a knowledge and uh, skills program called the Fundamentals of Laparoscopic Surgery. Um, it it uh, has a didactic curriculum that's web-based and the um, hands-on curriculum that was developed at McGill. And with, based on the data that we were able to generate, for the first time, we were able to go to the certification body, the American Board of Surgery, that certifies all surgeons to practice surgery in the United States and encourage them um, to incorporate this in the the requirements for certification. And it was incorporated, it was the first simulation um, ever uh, required as part of certification. And that was a huge step. It took a lot of political um, effort uh, and a lot of, of uh, research to go uh, behind it. Um, it then went on to uh, obstetrics and gynecology because gynecologists do laparoscopy and they didn't have anything like this. And then they have adopted this as part of their certification process. So we learned a lot of lessons uh, from um, FLS. And we, um, we think that these lessons should be those that we build on to, to come up with a way to train elite performers. We then went on to, to build a similar program for flexible endoscopy. So gastroscopies and colonoscopies, uh, develop the simulation, develop the evidence for the metrics and had this incorporated as part of the certification process as well. So um, the, the the next step is uh, while we while, you know, while we're doing image guided surgery, we have the opportunity to record what we do. And nowadays, with artificial intelligence and computer vision algorithms, they provide a means to take what we video to store it in a uh, secure and uh, private way, automatically annotate the videos into every step of the procedure uh, and provide analytics that we could use for quality uh, measures as well as education. Now, what are the type of things that it can capture? It could capture whether, um, how long it takes for you to do each, each step of the procedure. Uh, whether if there are best practice guidelines, it'll tell you whether you comply with them. Uh, if you cause an error in the course of uh, the operation that can be seen, so for instance, say you inadvertently um, provide uh, injure something by an energy source that was not your target, it will capture that. If you uh, make a hole in the bowel and you spill bowel contents, it will capture that. If you have bleeding, it will capture that. And then we could look at the relationship between what we do in the operating room and the outcomes and start to be able to develop best practices. So one project that we're working on uh, currently is we have 2,000 uh, videos of operations for gastric cancer from a uh, cancer hospital in Seoul, Korea, each of which has got five-year survival data, 30-day uh, surgical complication data, and pathology data that was developed prospectively. And we're going to be able to train our algorithm to be able to show um, what are the things that we do in the operating room that correlate with the ideal operation pathologically and in terms of five-year survival. So it's it's really quite exciting. SAGES uh, is now using video-based assessment as a way to ensure surgeons maintain their skills over the lifetime. So it's coming with anal uh, it's come out with analytics for a few specific operations and we'll be able to capture uh, performance and have uh, an independent person evaluate your video and give you feedback on it. 
So the idea of linking what we do in the operating room to patient outcomes is really uh, the important thing. And artificial intelligence is the technology that will allow us to do it. So just to kind of bring all this full circle, um, surgery is a performance art. Our culture should um, be for all of us to aspire to mastery. We should all want to be in the Hall of Fame. We should all want to be on the all-star team. And motivated surgeons have the tools to get there. Technology will help us, but we must have the will. And we must look at the, the model that elite performers have used in terms of coaching, preparation for performance, the use of videos and review and feedback. And the traditional ways that surgeons have learned, I think will be reinforced and improved upon by the technology used by elite learners. So the, the things that we're working on now is the uh, developing of a coaching model um, and having a, um, a peer coach work with surgeons, be able to share videos, uh, annotate and make comments on these videos and help people develop specific skills that you as a surgeon or as a, a highly qualified performer identify as your goal to take you to the next level. Uh, and we've started to study that. One of our, uh, our former uh, graduate students, so, uh, Sophia Valancey, um, is, who got her PhD with us, is now working at the Royal College, uh, developing a peer coaching program. And the Royal College is um, providing um, increasing credits for people that use coaching as a uh, modality to improve performance over their career. So to, to conclude, I think um, we, we should all agree, I, I would hope that surgery is performance field and that looking at other performance fields and the way people have achieved elite performance is an important um, learning opportunity for us to develop mastery in surgery. The advent and the rapid improvement in technology and what we've learned about distance learning, distance learning over the uh, COVID uh, pandemic um, has taught us that there are new opportunities to, to develop and, and improve our skills. And we're not limited to people in our home environment. We can have coaches anywhere in the world. The opportunity that computer vision uh, provides is ideal for any image guided surgery that we could record. And it makes um, coaching over video much more efficient and effective. Uh, and the analytics allow us to be able to track performance over time. So I really think there's a very rich opportunity uh, in surgical education um, with new technologies and simulation, virtual reality, art artificial intelligence, and the de development of meaningful um, reliable and valid metrics to measure performance um, will allow us to improve our surgical care and outcomes as effectively as any of the research approaches that I outlined in the first slide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Free. Do we have um, time for questions, Dr. Morley? Yeah, thank you for that wonderful uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Fried. And uh, thank you also for making it palatable to me. <laughs> the whole introduction, <laughs> aware of somebody who is not into surgery. As, as you are showing those uh, tennis players, I, it came to mind that uh, they warm up uh so is there when you're doing the simulation is there uh, do you include some sort of warm up or when people are doing surgery um that's a great question uh, faxon and in fact we have not done uh, specific work in that area but others have found that even a short period of warm up in a, on a simulator um improves performance in the operating room the other uh, area of warm up that we don't often talk about is mental warm-up, um, uh, kind of imaging, like thinking in your mind, uh, the steps of the operation. So you're mentally prepared for what you're going to uh, see and what and developing in your head a plan B, should you encounter something um, that might be uh, challenging 
uh, you know, think of different approaches that you might be able to shift to on the fly. So that that visualizing uh, part of it is something that elite performers do all the time. And if you speak to elite surgeons, um, that's another form of warm up or preparation that that we could do. Okay. So another question is, uh, is it, when you are talking about the scoring system, uh, yeah. is it possible to develop a scoring system that's based on, let's say, the criteria you are talking about, and then convert that into percentages? Because as a as as a as a patient, it would be easier for me to know the you know the that uh, a certain surgeon performed maybe close to 100%. Because is it possible to do that? So um, rating of surgeons has been around for a little while and the, it's a double-edged sword. So um, one of the fields that has been um, evaluated and disseminated publicly has been cardiac surgery. Um, what happens over time is that people become very selective about the operations that they choose to do. Because unless you can start to stratify the outcomes or the metrics of your performance um, according to the level of difficulty, then people will um, choose to avoid those difficult operations because it may it may dilute their their, their excellence. So uh, we don't have a level of sophistication in the clinical environment to be able to do that, um, and we don't have the uniform. Um, uh, I guess, engagement in, in simulated uh, performance testing once people leave the training programs to be able to provide this to the public. But I, I, I think that, you know, what the public will get will be outcomes. They'll be able to say, okay, the, um, the mortality rate when this guy does cardiac surgery or when this woman does valve surgery is so-and-so, and you're going to go to the person with the, with the best mortality figures, but you may not appreciate that all they do are are the, the the lowest risk people, and I think right now we're not at a level of being able to provide the type of um, information uh, to the public that will really reflect the quality. Thank you very much. There's a there's a question in the chat before we uh, before I get to it. I just want to abuse my uh, having the mic open to ask you something, and you know. What you're suggesting works for surgeons who are motivated to be excellent, right? But then <clears throat> I guess as a pay, I'm more I'm more with facts than on being a patient end of the spectrum. You know, detecting uh people who are suboptimal. As you said in that example, you know, that, that procedure done wrong can can be fatal. And I guess everyone wants to avoid people that can't do it well and and so you know people are not going to if they know that then maybe not as as good as they could be uh, or what or minimum levels of performance you know there's there's no compulsion right now for them to to be evaluated and to be measured so do you think it's going to take some kind of uh policy change or legal change uh for this to actually have a an impact on patient safety beyond helping people who are probably quite good and quite motivated achieve even better performance, uh, I, I think it's a it's a good question. It's a multi layered question. So I could give you a few answers. The after we um, presented our our work um, on on this with FLS, the U.S. Um, Department of Defense mandated that every surgeon in their program um, be FLS certified. And uh, they would not let anyone practice laparoscopy that did not uh, demonstrate um, you know, a level of excellence that they had set. Um, similarly, the Harvard hospitals um, were able to negotiate with their malpractice provider um, that uh, all those people that took and passed the FLS program um, have a reduction in their malpractice premiums and that the um, malpractice carrier would pay for their training. And uh, that came to be as well. Uh, the state of Texas, the University of Texas system, um, brought together all of the people practicing laparoscopy in the state in all specialties. And interestingly enough, that there was a very high failure rate. 
Uh, these are practicing people, not residents. And um, they uh, they required them all to, to take that and there was an improvement in performance. So there are specific examples of it. Um, at the individual hospital level, it's the responsibility of the chief of surgery to, to um, ensure that the people that are privileged to do specific procedures are, are competent to, to do that. Um, and so uh, there are very few um, hospitals that have um, maintained the requirement uh, outside of the Harvard and VA system, uh, and D a DOD system, I should say, um, that they be FLS certified. But, you know, this is another potential um, way of dealing with that. Thank you. There's a question from Razan Kassab. Um, and if I get your question wrong, then uh, feel free to chip in, uh, Razan. But it says, uh, do you have simulation boxes for all kind of laparoscopic, laparoscopic procedures in general, surgery, urological procedures, bariatric, et cetera, to train your residents, or is it one? So um, there there are uh, simulations for a number of different procedures, some of which are can be done in a box trainer, some of which are done in virtual reality uh, training systems. They each have their limitations. Uh, people have also used 3D printed models of, an, uh, of anatomy to put in a simulator box. People have used uh, explants or organs from animals that they put in, in trainer boxes. There are many different uh, approaches to it. There's not a single one that is optimal for every type of skill and procedure that we want to learn. So, uh, so it's a mixed model. There's a follow-on question from the same person asking about, uh, do you use videos uh, to train residents at the simulation center? And how much time do they spend watching them? Um, so we use videos uh, of actual surgical procedures that, um, that residents do, and their supervisors often use these to evaluate them and to provide them feedback. Um, in the simulation center, we have the capacity to video uh, in, in all our environments. We sometimes use them, sometimes we do not. Um, an ideal simulation exercise is associ associated with a debriefing period where you can um, um, constructively uh, critique the, you know, the person's performance and give them uh, ideas on, on how they might improve that. Um, I can't give you the average amount of time. It, it really varies a lot uh, according to the specific uh, program, who, who the teacher is, and and how motivated the students are. Okay, there's a question from uh, Nidhi Abraham asking how simulation helps trainees deal with unexpected things like anatomical variants. Um, so there are some... Um, virtual reality simulations that have a number of variants. Um, a lot of the training for the variants, uh, you know, variant anatomy or variant diseases is done through videos. So if you have the skill set um, to be able to do the operation and kind of uh, the strategy, then discussing the videos and explaining how you might alter your uh, training from the uh, kind of the, the ideal uh, model, the ideal operation, to this more aberrant uh, anatomical or, or or disease state that make 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 the operation more challenging, is part of the um, uh, is part of how we, we use video. So by having a library and being able to um, to have comments uh, introduced into these videos, it provides a very valuable way that uh, you could use uh, videos for training in these rarer events. Thank you. Then. Um... Zhao asks you, um, congratulations, what's the average uh, learning curve to develop and uh, get enough laparoscopic skills in order to perform an MIS by yourself? Oh. Uh, th there's no um, there's no easy answer for that. I think it, developed, it depends a lot on the innate skills um, that any individual person has uh, and, the, and the specific operation you're training them to do because there are uh, easier minimally invasive operations and there are more complex ones. And there, there are people, patients that might have anatomic challenges. Uh, they may be very obese. They may have had previous surgery and scarring. They may have very advanced disease so that uh, any particular operation is, is highly variable. Uh, I would say the bottom level would be 
about six to eight hours to be able to have the skills, that is the fundamental skills and using the instruments to be able to, um, to use those instruments to conduct an operation that you already know the steps to do. Uh, so I would say that would be the, the very, very minimal uh, level. Great. I'm not sure what you're thinking uh, there, whether he's thinking he could sort of train train himself to go off. Anyway, so uh, Jeffrey, <laughs> maybe you should practice on the dog first. All right, so uh, Jeffrey is asking, you mentioned communication with the assistant as being a challenge. Are there simulators that help trainees practice working with an assistant and in communication with the team, I guess? So um, it, this is an area that we don't do as well as we should. We do simulations for team training around uh, resuscitation. So we have these um, look like robot uh, mannequin simulators. And uh, we do scenarios where, for instance, a patient comes into the emergency room in shock. You have a doctor, a nurse, and maybe a, 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 a trainee. Uh, in the emergency room, each of them assumes a role, and then you work on communication, prioritization uh, in uh, resuscitating that person. We don't use it so much in the conduct of a, a specific surgical operation, um, although we do uh, some training um, on um, cadavers, where uh, so human cadavers, where we we have uh, multiple people doing an operation together, like they would in the operating room. Okay, so I, th I think we're out of time. So thank you once again uh, very much for your for your brilliant talk. And um, if you've lit the fire in uh, any of the attendees' interest in in simulate research and simulation or other ideas they have on simulation, or that, how would they uh, how would they interact with you in the simulation center? Just well, I, I I think it depends on the context of their their graduate program. I mean, I, I think uh, any of them is welcome to a visit. If they want to do a project, then we want to make sure that it's of sufficient quality and uh, that there is supervision, et cetera. So uh, I can't uh, supervise everybody that might want to do a simulation um, research program, but I might be able to identify someone who can work with them um, if they have an idea for a project that that, uh, that would be attractive. So they could they could reach out to me by email. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have one last question. One question. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm afraid, yeah, so wonderful. Uh, it's an amazing well, presentation. Well. Very informative. Uh, I learned quite a bit here. I just had a question. Since you, I was kind of impressed with uh, the development of a, a, a simulation with as little as $50. I think you demonstrated to students doing that. And that was I was quite impressive to be doing that. So I was, I was just, my question was related, not so specific, but to the surgical simulation, but more on a political aspect. Have you thought about um, implementing or aiding, let's say, third world countries in training their surgeons using these types of simulations, since it would be an economical advantage? So we have been doing that. Um, so we have been, um, we've taken the FLS program to Mongolia. Um, and uh, um, got them to, to start doing laparoscopic surgery. Um, one of our former um, fellows uh, did a program um, with two countries in Africa um, to uh, use a telesimulation to train them uh, and show that it, it uh, both of these um, examples of the incorporation, the safe incorporation of laparoscopy had a huge impact on um, the economics of, of uh, the individuals. So you can imagine if you're in a very poor country and you are dependent on the breadwinner to go to work every day and they're unable to uh, to work for six weeks because they've had a, an operation, they may be reluctant to have that operation. And even though it sounds like a minimally invasive surgery technology is very expensive, it isn't. And if we could train people to do it and get people back to work or back in the fields in, in a couple of days rather than six weeks, then it has a huge impact. And, and um, so it's been very widely embraced in uh, in the developing world. And the uh, FLS program has been uh, used all over the world, literally um, for training people because it's so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. right. Amazing. Oh, thank you. So Preston Wiley, any, any closing remarks? Uh, thank you very much uh, again, Dr. Fried and everyone uh, for the uh, showing up.
and uh, we will have this them uh, next week on Tuesday. And Dr. Fried, thank you for all the help. I don't know how you do it. Whenever I've asked for your help, you made yourself available. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.